Hey, everybody. Whoa. I'm louder than I'm used to. Uh, this is proof of life that I actually have a life outside of code. Um, just making sure that you know they're alive. Um, I do have a, I've been around since uh, the late 90s doing a lot of this kind of stuff. Um, I came as really a 3D artist originally and learned how to do C and Python and things to elevate tools and then started getting into game development and kept going down that route. And I kept having an eye for what was possible on the web. I thought it was an amazing platform. Um, when you compile stuff in C++ and you create a native binary, um, you're really limited in how you distribute that. And I thought there's something special about the web, especially for uh, more dynamic content. Um, and in that thing, I don't consider myself a JS developer or TypeScript developer. I kind of see myself as a lower level guy. I'm much more comfortable in shaders than I am uh, in JavaScript. I don't understand JavaScript at all. Um, but I have been trying to fight the fight for a long time. Every single one of these things above the line, I have deployed something or built a, a project in um, and had to live with it and know kind of what the, uh, the trade-offs are. And I have some pretty strong opinions at this point in my career. Um, the ones below the line is me trying to find a different and better way for me, for the kinds of things that I run into. Um, to give you an idea, this is one of the projects I absolutely loved working on. Um, it was doing a real-time system for every radar our every radar uh, blip from every continental United States uh, radar system uh, in real time. So we're talking 800,000 um, radar blips per second um, and being able to watch this real time live and be able to scrub at any point in an hour's worth of data in real time. Uh, there is a patent in this. I feel really strongly that I did some pretty good stuff here. And this was just a regular web app from uh, the outside. It was using Vue and WebGL and WebSockets. But I was having to abuse the system and really get into the low level things, understanding TurboFan, understanding how V8 works at a low level to get that kind of performance out of things. So I feel like I've really explored what uh, spas are capable of. Um, I also love Nats. You'll see me uh, talk so much about it, they actually hired me because I love it so much. Um, I work there now at Sanadia, and I'm uh, there to help people build large distributed systems. If you've never heard of Nats, uh, we're the backbone of a lot of messaging systems. Um, we go from an embedded device all the way out to uh, global superclusters. In fact, this is pictures of stuff that we have is I made for internal tools to watch in real time our global superclusters for multi-tenancy and be able to see what our access patterns are live. Um, and so I also work on proof of concepts for us, and I found that doing distributed data systems in the browser is really hard when you get into very large scale problems. Oh, also, this is not a Sanadio talk, it's not a NAS talk, I just love them. Um, and uh, these are not their opinions, they're definitely my own. <laughs> um, I find spas incredibly complicated. Uh, I feel like I have a pretty good grasp as a developer, but I'm sure all of you have hit these issues. And some of this stuff I just may not be smart enough for because I don't know how to make sense of it as the project goes on farther and farther. So I feel like I hit, hit an asymptote and I can't get above that uh, for doing the kinds of things I want to do. And then I found this thing called uh, Hypermedia. If you haven't seen, if you don't know who that is, that's Roy Felding. He's the guy who came up with the, uh, the term rest. And if you don't know why this is so funny, you probably haven't read this book. Um, even if you're not a f big user of Hypermedia stuff in general and you, and you don't know what Rust is, I think this is, at least especially part one, is mandatory reading for anyone that does web development. Um, it really does give you a history of how we got here. Um, when I started, it was right when CSS existed. So um, a lot of people I've found don't really know how we got to the point where we're at now. And I'm that guy. Like, I'm not putting the blame on everyone else. I, until maybe two years ago, really did not understand what the term REST meant. And I was like, I don't care. Just give me my data. I want it in my JSON or my binary streams. I don't care. Um, and I have found that that was a mistake on my part. And I think a lot of us are making that same mistake. Um, there's a lot of memes in this community. Uh, if you've ever seen HTMX and stuff, man, they go meme heavy. So, um, but this one meme is probably the most prophetic thing for me believe it or not, of all the things I've seen. And it's, what it's showing is that you're doing a lot of ETL, a lot of state transfers to get stuff from your source of truth, whether it's a DB or a, a game engine, and turning it into HTML. And the more you can get closer to the actual concept that's going straight from the source of truth to what the user needs, um, that is really powerful. And what the thing is, it didn't remind me of any of the different tech stacks or any of the spas or anything. It actually reminded me of a talk I saw 20 years ago when you had to download things for four hours to get a tiny video. And this is uh, Casey. He's probably best known nowadays for Handmade Hero. But I knew of his work back at uh, Rad Game Tools and on Granny and all that stuff. And he did this amazing talk 
about immediate mode versus retain mode GUIs. And with retain mode, it's the way you think of, most people think about um, GUIs in general, is you have a button with a bunch of state, and you define where it is on the page, and what st uh, if it's hovered, and all that. With immediate mode, you're basically saying, look, I'm going to throw this button away next frame because I don't know where it's going to be on the page. I don't know what, if the button's even allowed anymore. All the things change every single frame, so it's actually cheaper to create buffers and to re just render the quad where you need it at the moment you need it. And the irony is that's actually faster than doing it in a retain mode way because you're doing the, just the work that has to be done for the next frame because you know it's going away. So the part that I feel like I really missed out on for years is that spas to me are like a retain mode and hypermedia is an immediate mode of rendering. Um, this is, if you go look at some game stuff, you'll see like this can be a pretty profound thing. And I wanted to show that what is capable in this, if you have this mental model. Um, I've bounced off of a ton of libraries. I've used everybody's stuff. I have strong opinions, but I ended up saying, hey, I need something to fit my needs. So uh, at the bottom, I definitely am using TypeScript if I have to use JavaScript, because JavaScript's the only game in town. Um, everything I wanted to be a plugin, I wanted to be, be able to be wrong about my uh, assumptions. I wanted to be right about the general idea, but wrong about how I wrote that code. Um, I wanted to be in the specs compliant. I'm so glad signals are now becoming a popular thing. Um, I've been following Ryan and the SJS stuff for years, and I'm so glad that it, this is not um, out of the blue now. And I wanted there to be a marketplace of ideas so that I'm, will, I'm ready to be wrong. Uh, part of the spec is that ev on every element, you have the ability to add this thing called data dash elements. And what that means is you get a little key value of just string string that you can do whatever you want with. And I kind of thought that was a silly thing, like what am I going to do with this? I already have all my state on the page. This seems kind of dumb. But I started g going at first principles and saying, okay, what can I actually use this for? And the spec is data dash star and, huh, data star. Okay, so I made this th framework called data star, um, actually a library called data star. And the first principle is, the one thing is you have to start with data dash for everything that you do on the page. Um, so that kind of limits some of the constraints. But remember, it's just a key and a value. It's just a string and a string. What can we do with that? So I was like, OK, what do I want out of this? So I made a store. I made a model. There's the dollar sign that you see in the, in the text. That was just a semantic I said that said, kind of looked like Svelte, where you say, this is a reactive signal. So anytime this changes, it automatically reruns that thing. Same thing with the show and click. And the nice thing is that I was able to define the semantics that made sense to me. Um, so this looks a lot like Alpine or parts like Svelte. And I felt like this was a pretty clear indication of what's going on. Same thing with the back end. Their test, oh, ooh, yeah. Um, the same with the back end. I have this thing of dollar dollar. Um, I don't know if that's the best look, but the nice thing is this is plug and play. So uh, what that is, is it's a sandboxed action. We don't, I'm not running eval and doing raw strings. I'm actually doing function constructors, stuff that Alpine is doing, but they don't really expose it in an easy to use way. So I make it so that you can add something that you know is safe, that runs in this context, and that you're allowing to, to uh, know about what else is going on in the system. So, but that's it. Basically, what I wanted to do is I wanted to take the things that I would have to write by hand in signals and things, because I think signals are amazing, but they're also easy to mess up. Um, I wanted to take them, make them declarative, and then just get back to the things that I was interested in doing. Um, I don't want to have a library or a framework that I'm maintaining forever. I want to get these tools in people's hands so that I can go back to doing what I'm doing. Uh, so Datastar is only about 300 lines long. It's, all it's doing is taking those, that key value and breaking it up in a way so you can have modifiers and all kinds of things, and they can know about each other. But um, it's really small, and I think it's uh, pretty easy to keep in your head once you get into the code. Um, we have a contributor that said, wow, you really aren't kidding. Because even the signal, dollar sign, the dollar, everything's a plugin. So everything's switching out bold. The only thing that's not is signals. Because I think that core idea of signals is really powerful. Uh, these are the plugins I needed. So I just went to work making the things that I needed um, and solving my own problem. Uh, most of these things you'll see are just the things that you need in a normal spa. Um, so I did all those things. Even like uh, re uh, debounce and raft and all these kind of things. Being able to go online and offline it's just a key value. I can, I can make semantics that make sense for me. The thing is, once I got those all in place, uh, people were saying, hey, can you include these so that this is just the default? Uh, so I was really proud of the fact that I had this tiny library, but people were like, no, I really want a framework to do this kind of stuff. Um, so these are the th all the lines that are necessary to actually run. It's actually just three lines of code. Um, but again, you can change this out and be, make your own framework with this concept. The crazy thing is adding all those things together. I didn't want it to be this big bloated thing. It's tiny, because the problem is with things like HTMX, you always have to add something if you want reactivity on the page. 
Um, so it ends up being a lot bigger, and they have overlapping concepts of what events are and who owns basically the main loop, and there's a lot of overlap. So I felt like I was always fighting things, whereas here, I have all the things, and it's tiny, and I pay it one time, and it doesn't matter if there's 10 things on the page or 10,000 things, it's already cached. It's a one-time cost, and hopefully as more people use it, it'll already be in your browser. Um, the other thing is these things, all, all these other spot frameworks, take more and more JavaScript over time. Data store doesn't cost anything more than that first load. Um, the other thing is out of that 14 uh, kilobytes, over 45% is using other people's stuff. I'm using Azure has a really smart way of doing uh, SEC events. Uh, Idiomorph, which is actually comes to the HTMX community, but they think Idiomorph is too big of a leap to actually put into HTMX. I said, no, it's the best idea. I'm going to use it directly. And then there's some stuff around merging and stuff that I feel like I don't understand TypeScript enough to do this stuff, so I'm, I'm relying on some libraries to help me out. Um, the one thing I will say is that there's, because you have signals, it's so powerful, you need very few tags to actually express yourself because most of the stuff is reactive you get for free. Um, data star total right now is 11 tags for the whole thing, and then most of the time I use two or three, sometimes five. So uh, this is a full way of doing things that actually takes very little to learn. So I think it's easier to learn, it's smaller, and it's more extendable. So the normal flow that we go through, we've all done this, if we've done spot apps, and HTMX actually kind of works the same way, is you get the initial page, and then you start pulling either requesting JSON or requesting fragments that get updating to your page, and you have this loop that you're going through. Um, the stuff I do, this is too slow. It's just not good enough. So the push flow that I do, every single thing in the, the plugins that I write, if you're interacting with the server, it's always SSE. And what that does is it allows you to, once you get that initial page going, you can just start firing down events as soon as you know that something changes. So you're not relying on the updates or things, you're getting direct access so that if an event's coming from around the world, I can update immediately or I can handle the back pressure myself. Um, I think that's really powerful. And it's not like uh, uh, WebSockets because this is just normal HTTP. It's regular get post, get patch. You're just setting a couple of content flags and possibly doing keep alive depending on how you set things up but it's just regular HTTP. There's nothing special about it. Um, I think all these things are really powerful. I think the biggest thing of these, of any of them, is that you can send down HTML fragments or you can send down signals directly. So you can actually patch things that, and be crazy fast. And the other thing is the server is in control of the back pressure, so no one can DDoS you. You can say that, look, this person paid more, I'm gonna give them a higher quality of service. This thing's going down, we need to set an emergency, I'm gonna change the entire flow of my channels to allow them to get more data. It's really, really powerful once you do this kind of thing. And part of the thing I do is I make sure that you can change any part of the page at any time. Um, that's just a built-in concept because I need to be able to move quickly. Um, people sometimes ask why I don't use WebSockets. I have a lot of experience in that. Um, I am betting on HTTP 2 and 3 because of all the multiplexing, and I can get into the weeds with that with you guys, but I've run into a ton of issues doing high-scale uh, applications with them. So I want to get a, give you kind of an idea of the stuff that I'm interested in. A lot of things I can't show right now or, or is um, kind of under wraps because I help other customers, but this is something that is kind of near and dear to my heart because I do love NATS, and I think it's amazing. And the problem is with teaching NATS is it is so simple and yet the, the sets of situations you get yourself in is so complicated, it's very hard to teach. We have a bunch of really smart people there, but they're all CLI demos, and we don't have a good way to create content. So I was like, I think I can solve this, and I think making it fun and interactive would be an interesting way to go about doing that. So I'm going to show you a little demo. This is something that I've done in the last month or so, and I've done all the art in back end and front end and and most of the time I've been spending with it is actually working on the little game engine thing part of it. So almost none of this has to do with Datastar, but I, I think I hopefully it shows you what it uh, enables. So let's let's pray to the demo gods. We're doing it live. Okay, I, let's see how that looks on screen. Press the button. Nope, not that one. Sorry. Okay, can we see, uh, let's make that a little bit smaller. Okay, can you guys still see that? Okay, great. So this is a, a, a little uh, interactive base, uh, tutorial on teaching you how to use the basics of NATS. And I have these buttons on screen where basically the one says, uh, you can press one because it's the first choice and B is back. So I'm just switching between these things. I found out today, it's actually at 144 frames per second here and it's only at like 30 on there. Like apparently the projector isn't showing this. So if you want to come see the app, it's actually buttery smooth, but unfortunately you, 
you guys can't see that as well as you can see it here. Um, but the nice part is I'm changing out all the different pieces. Someone's talking. There's it's regular stuff going on on the page. And as you interact with the page, you start to unlock new quests. Because this is more of a teaching tool. So we've done one quest. Now we're going to unlock another one. And in this case, I just changed out the scene. And I'm going through here and explaining a little bit. This is just a bunch of text. You don't need to learn about that today. Um, but I want to give you an idea of kind of the cool things we can do from here. So this next one, I just created this little button on the side. And I'm going to click it. And the person says, hey, nothing happened. And that's because you haven't subscribed to a message yet. So we're going to put something. We're going to create a data-driven scene that has a lamppost in it. And now, when I click on this button, the thing updates there. What's I think cool is you can click on this little copy button. We can open a terminal and paste that in. And now, in the terminal, I'm affecting what's going on in the scene right now. So they are both tied together and completely independent at the same time. Um, there's some pretty neat ideas, I think, in there for teaching. Um, and then here, we're getting a little more complicated. We're saying, hey, you can have these different states. And if you hit ping, it, it takes whatever state it was and goes back to it after a certain timeout and uh, sets all that stuff up. So I feel like it's a way to interactively start to add more and more complexity and do it in a visual way. Because when you're just looking at a console, it's kind of hard to follow uh, what all can be going on here. In this case, I'm showing three lights. And when you press the one button, they're all subscribing to the same message. So they'll get the same message. And if I do that same thing I did before, where I do a ping, same thing. But now all three of them are getting it. Again, we're just trying to ramp up the stuff by but keeping it simple, looking simple. Uh, here is a little more complex, because now you're controlling every light completely independently and still able to send those individual calls. So you can set the individual states and start watching it. Cool. So we talk a little bit more. And then we unlock, I think, where it starts getting interesting for most of you guys. So in this case, what I did is I basically, here's a park. Uh, there's no animation yet. That's my fault. Um, I kind of ran out of time. But I, this uh, blimp is actually pulling out weather data live. And you see that it's starting to fill up the, the frame here. Well, I can take that same thing, copy it over, and look at that live. And I'm looking at the same data, whether it came to the browser or came to the back end, um, which I think is, is, is a neat way to interact with things. Same thing happens here. Now this is a, a greater than. It's just saying, hey, look, give me every type of topic after this. So this gives you huge amounts of data. And same thing, I can just copy here and get right back into the thing. And I'm seeing the same thing, whether I'm interacting with the thing. And the idea is that over time, you actually start having to, to interact with the, the game. You're actually having to write your own code and do tests where it's actually publishing and sending things to you. And now you're interacting with it, not only in the browser, but in your own code, and having that interaction where you actually see live testing of whatever app you write in whatever language you write, because we're agnostic to that. Um, and in this case, I added a, a vehicle to the, the page. What it's doing is, uh, you'll, sorry, he's drunk. I, my pathing's bad. Um, but there's a sensor on the screen that's actually looking at CO2 sensor data. And this is all live being calculated right now on the back end. And the, the truck's driving around. And you're getting, these are live metrics. This guy's pulling out data a lot faster than the other guy. And we're doing like hundreds of frames a second, uh, or hundreds of frames of data per second. But NAS goes up into millions of messages a second. So this is like small potatoes. And the part that I think is, gets even more interesting is now I made a slider where, OK, I'm going to slow it down around there. And so now this, this is like when we work with factory floors and we're saying, hey, we need an emergency stop to stop all vehicles right now. This is the kind of stuff that is really just kind of standard box standard for us, but it's really hard to visualize. And being able to affect it here, but also change, have someone learn that, hey, what if I change it to, I don't know, instead of 0.12 velocity, let's do 12,000 velocity. Now, there's literally no difference in the frame rate, there's nothing that changes because all this stuff is being calculated in the back end and you're showing the, the data live. Um, it makes it really powerful to do some really interesting things because I'm not afraid of frame rates. And this is on a garbage Lenovo laptop. This is, not, this is just regular integrated graphics. There's nothing special um, that I'm doing here. So if we take this and kind of, here we can close that for now. If we take this and I open up a new tab. And I just copy this URL over. I'm actually sharing that data directly right now. Everything, they're completely independent from 
Uh, they're, they're actually sharing the exact same moments in time in data. They're uh, completely decoupled. But at the same time, there's certain things on the page where I don't want to mess with someone's uh, button when they're, when they're playing with it, right? I, don't, I want that to be independent. So when you're talking about like military applications where you're saying, I want to do dissemination controls, and I want to say, I control, I'm going to show you all, all a shared screen, but maybe this person gets extra data or things. You can do these things in state that are just really hard to do, and I found to be near impossible for me in a spa. So the other thing is, I think, kind of cool about this is that we can even go back to that original screen, and we're actively looking at whatever's the same at the same time. So let me get back into talk time. OK, so what, what, what was I just doing there, right? Like, it seemed like some shenanigans going on. Um, I have a stack that works for me. This stuff kind of works in a lot of different ways, but I found GoNets and DataStar to work really well together. Um, a, a friend at work calls it GoNets. It's the funniest thing ever because we're children. Um, but it's, the, it's a pretty funny site if you want to go look at it. Uh, I love the fact that it's a single binary. It's a stack thing. It's easy to work with. Uh, Go gets a kind of a better app sometimes around GC, but if you're smart, you can avoid that doing game engine -y kind of stuff. Come talk to me later about it. And the nice thing is this is all event-driven. The, the stack is built to do interesting things. You could do the same kinds of things in Haskell, but I just don't see the performance there that I need. The other thing that you might not be surprised by, that entire demo, the entire thing I was doing was one git. It was one single git for the entire thing. And because what I'm doing, this is the entire git call. All I'm doing is saying, take the current state and render it out. That's it. There's nothing else going on. So the actual the interesting thing is I am sending down new state every single frame at 144 frames a second. Um, and it only took me four tags of Datastar to do the, the entire demo. Um, people think, oh, it's really complicated. No, it, the entire thing, including sending down the game engine, getting a mutex, holding on to it, doing all the rendering, turning into HTML, doing all the stuff, is 400 lines of code. So I feel like this is a breath of fresh air compared to what I'm used to because I'm getting the performance numbers I need, and it's actually less code. Um, and I think that's really powerful. So the other thing I'm doing right now, which is incredibly stupid, but sometimes you do stupid things as a game developer to know what your headroom is so that when you do smart things, you know how much room you have to go. Um, in that welcome page, I'm sending down every single tile for every positioning of everything on the, on the thing with thousands of elements that you saw in the city every single frame. I'm not saying you should do this. I'm saying that I'm doing it, and it works fine. That should tell you something about your, if it's OK for me to do this in a game engine, it, Datastar can probably handle your web form. The other thing that's interesting as a game guy, I want to get things, I care about metrics. Performance matters the most. Um, the interesting thing is 13 meg for all the content, the, the web server, the NATS embedded server, all the stuff in the game, all the game logic is 13 megs. Uh, it maxes out because I'm doing things around sparse sets and uh, Swiss tables and stuff like that. But it maxes out at 13 megabytes, and I ran it all night. Um, I actually found issues with 3GS as a uh, as a library that it has some mem leaks. So I'm going to help try to fix those. But what's also interesting is I don't know how much you guys have looked at performance things, but that's a lot of room between frames. There's nothing going on because you're not doing all your JavaScript on the front end. You're letting the DOM do its job, and there's nothing faster than the way that you do that first content page of HTML, imagine if you do that with every single other thing in what you're doing. So if you can tie directly to signals and you can tie directly to fragments, um, you get a lot of headroom. And these thicker things are the entire network call that's happening. So it's happening within a subframe timings. Um, people say, well, what about the 3D engine? Web components. I am now a converter to it. Before, it didn't make any sense. If you have all your logic in the front end, web components are dumb. They just don't make sense. I already have my logic here. Why would I wrap it up? But when all of a sudden you are using those web components to create new elements, to do things that are complicated, like a 3D engine, or maybe a really complicated charting thing where you have internal state, that has nothing to do with what's driving it. So to me, web components are about making new elements, and data start is how to drive every element and every attribute, because you can tie it in everywhere. And I think that's a really powerful combination that I didn't understand before I got into this. Oh, and the entire engine for doing it, it's 800 lines of code. Uh, soup to nuts. The entire thing. Um, people might say, hey, this is, it seems like it may be more, more complicated. I'm not a game dev person. Um, the thing is, I just wrote the code so that I don't have to write the code again. If we go look at this, I just made it so that there's a markdown page that an author can go and make a tutorial without getting me involved. And then I came up with some things like, hey, I want to be able to load a level. I want to set subscriptions. I want to have these actions that people can do. You do this in a data-driven way, and everything else comes out of this. Um, I think it's a really interesting area, and I think Cogen and uh, game development ideas 
could be used for making websites and it, you'd be smaller, faster, and better. So this is, how many React developers do we have here? Vue, Svelte, HTMX, there he is. Knew he was right there. Okay, so these are some hot takes coming from someone uh, who doesn't consider myself part of the community, even though I try to do some pretty hardcore stuff. Um, I think spas are a really bad idea for the modern web. Um, they made sense back when I was starting, when you had Glassfish and you had one thread is one request and you could not rely on the server to get back to you in time. And responsiveness was an impossibility. I get it. I was there for it. I dedicated way too much time to doing a lot of things in JavaScript uh, to push the, what interactivity could be. Um, the problem is I feel like we've been People like Ryan Carnito, the, the TAN stack, all these things, they've been solving these amazing ways of doing things, but I almost feel like we're solving the wrong problem. Um, and I have n over, there's almost like a law, I don't know how to, how to really put it in words, that over a long enough time period, you're always gonna overshare data when it comes to building a spa. And I work on military application stuff, and that's dangerous. And it could be dangerous to your users and stuff, because you can, you're always gonna overshare, and when you undershare, then you, you start losing features. And I think that's a bad situation to be in, and I'm, I just see it happening. Uh, don't worry, I think, HT, eh, test. Uh, I think HTMX it may be a bad idea as well. I actually don't think the library is bad at all. I think the way that people have been using it is doing it a disservice, and doing hypermedia a disservice. And um, it's ironic, Alex is here, he's on the HTMC, and he also agrees with me, HX Boost uh, is a bad idea, so please don't use it. Um, but I do think that there, the lulls and the, the, in fact, I don't, I must have, I lost a slide somewhere. Um, there's a, there's a slide where it has to do with, there's a, a talk from a uh, big sky conference called abusing hypermedia. And it, what it was talking about is like, these are all these things you should never do in hypermedia. And I think it was, I, I talked to Nate after, and I think it's a badly named talk because it's things that you shouldn't do in HTMX. Um, and the thing is, he was doing like Flappy Bird and he was getting like 13 French seconds, sometimes five, sometimes you know, 18. And it was funny, it was a joke to people. And I feel like we're missing the boat. And I'm, what I'm fearful of is that I love that HTMX has gotten so popular. And my fear is, is we're gonna have the same thing that happened with spas in that we're doing the wrong thing and we're building things the wrong way and it all of a sudden we run into the same traps that I've ran into for the last 25 years. So I, I understand that the, the lulls have their place, but I think that equating current implementations to what hypermedia is, is really doing a disservice to everybody. Um, I, however, I do agree, um, Alex just did a talk on the TripTech proposal, which basically wants to fix some of HTML's uh, shortcomings. I think that's a great idea. I want to see that happen. Um, it ironically will make both of our libraries quite a bit smaller, and that's a good thing. It's a good for everybody. There's not a lot of us. Uh, if you want to show any kind of support, send us a GitHub star, because that's how you define your worth. Um, there's a lot of people that are using it, or not a lot of people that are using it, but the people that are using it are working on really hard problems. They're doing military applications, medical imagery, uh, real-time uh, inferencing on AI uh, for important work we can go into. It, it's getting used in interesting places. And some of these people feel very strongly about uh, the, the current state of affairs. And some of them come from the 90s. Some of them are brand new devs that have just kind of bounced off of the, the same spots that I, I ran into issues with. Uh, Bill Kennedy is a uh, big name in the Go environment. I got a chance to have him take a look at it. And I just thought this is a, a really good thing of like, hey, this makes sense to me now. Because I feel like a lot of times, if you don't really push hard on what is possible and what, we get so used to what the complications of the web that we miss the fact that it doesn't have to be this complicated. Um, I think we've missed a lot of the value of what the web is supposed to be. It's supposed to be this fast, interactive way to give new and interesting features at a moment's notice. And it doesn't feel like that. My NPM modules, I, I don't know, man. It doesn't feel, it feels bad. Um, Carson is also probably my favorite quote. It, this is from a, a while back. Uh, I've been working on Datastar for like a year, year and a half now. And he's like, yeah, it's probably a better approach, but, but I'm not gonna use it. Um, and I understand his position. Um, if you've ever read HTMX Sucks, um, I feel like that's a love letter to me. 
because uh, I've brought up all these issues. And the thing is, that's fine. He's happy where it's at. He's happy with where things are and what it's doing because it works for him. And I'm not saying that the, the, the things that I've done so far are the correct answers. What I'm saying is that this is doing some things that I haven't seen other people be able to do. So this is the base layer, and now we can build up from here. Um, I was going to try to release Datastar uh, 1.0 at the conference, and I think that's a bad idea. And the reason why is because, to me, Datastar is not a framework, but it is a library, and it is all TypeScript driven. And I was trying to do some interesting things around being really type safe and having plugins understand what other plugins were doing and how they were interacting with each other. And I feel like I've done a bad job because there's a lot of things around anys and unknowns and things that I know that could be inferred that I'm missing the boat on. And it's my fault, and I don't know how to fix it. And I want some people that are really smart and really understand this stuff to get in there and see the intent and then move the needle forward. Um, I think HTMX did an amazing job of moving the needle forward on hypermedia. I think there's an opportunity for people that are really passionate to move the needle forward on what the web really is and how TypeScript can actually make it so that we can write well-defined, understood types and then the user doesn't have to care about that at all. Like the guy that's writing Haskell doesn't have to care about TypeScript. The guy that, but you're building the, the things in a declarative way so that they can all be involved and we can all work together and actually make really interesting stuff. So if you are a TypeScript developer, please come talk to me. Um, sh I want to show you my code and I want you to yell at me for how bad it is. So um, with that, I really do want to make the web declarative again. And I would happy to hear your questions because I just told you React sucks and so does everything else. <laughs>